Disc 26, Thief of Time By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 15x19 And then disintegrated, tiny particles spinning away and, dis and disappearing into nothing. For a moment the last few handfuls tried to form, in the air, the shape of a small cowled figure. Then it too was dragged apart, with a faint scream that was heard via the hairs on the back of the neck. Susan glared at the figure in front of her. You're a... You can't be a... What are you? she demanded. The figure was silent. This might have been because thick cloth covered its nose and mouth. Heavy gloves encased its hands. And this was odd, because most of the rest of it was wearing a sequined evening gown. And a mink stole. And a knapsack. And a huge picture hat with enough feathers to make three rare species totally extinct. The figure rummaged in the knapsack, and then thrust out a piece of dark brown paper, as if proffering holy writ. Lobsang took it with care. It says here Higgs Uxury Assortment, he said. Caramel Crunch, Hazelnut Surprise. They're chocolates. Susan opened her hand and looked at the crushed strawberry whirl she had picked up. She gave the figure a careful look. How did you know that would work, she said. Please. You have nothing to fear from me, said the muffled voice through the bandages. I'm down to the ones with the nuts in now, and they don't melt very quickly. Sorry, said Lobsang. You just killed an auditor with a chocolate. My last orange cream, yes. We are exposed here. Come with me. An auditor. Susan breathed. You're an auditor too. Aren't you? Why should I trust you? There isn't anyone else. But you are one of them, said Susan. I can tell, even under all that. That stuff. I was one of them said Lady L.E. Jean. Now I rather think I'm one of me. People were living in the attic. There was a whole family up there. Susan wondered if their presence was official or unofficial or one of those in-between states that were so common in Ankh-Morpork, where there was always a chronic housing shortage. So much of the city's life took place on the street because there was no room for it inside. Whole families were raised in shifts so that the bed could be used for 24 hours a day. By the look of it, the caretakers and men who knew the way to Caravati's three large pink women and one piece of gauze had moved their families into the rambling attics. The rescuer had simply moved in on top of them. A family, or at least one shift of it, was seated on benches around a table. Frozen in timelessness. Lady L.E. Jean removed her hat hung it on the mother and shook out her hair. Then she unwrapped the heavy bandages from her nose and mouth. We are relatively safe here, she said. They are mostly in the main streets. Good. Day. My name is Miria L.E. Jean. I know who you are, Susan Stohelet. I do not know the young man, which surprises me. I take it you are here to destroy the clock. To stop it, said Lobsang. Hold on, hold on, said Susan. This makes no sense. Auditors hate everything about life. And you are an auditor, aren't you? I have no idea what I am, sighed Lady L.E. Jean. But right now I know that I am everything an auditor should not be. We. They. We have to be stopped. With chocolate, said Susan. The sense of taste is new to us. Alien. We have no defenses. But. Chocolate. A dry biscuit almost killed me, said her ladyship. Susan, can you imagine what it is like to experience taste for the first time? We built our bodies well. Oh, yes. Lots of taste buds. Water is like wine. But chocolate. Even the mind stops. There is nothing but the taste. 
she sighed. I imagine it is a wonderful way to die. It doesn't seem to affect you, said Susan suspiciously. The bandages and the gloves, said Lady L.E. Jean. Even then it is all I can do not to give in. Oh, where are my manners? Do sit down. Pull up a small child. Lobsang and Susan exchanged a glance. Lady L.E. Jean noticed it. I said something wrong, she said. We don't use people as furniture, said Susan. But surely they will not be aware of it, said her ladyship. We will, said Lobsang. That's the point, really. Ah. I have so much to learn. There is. There is so much context to being human, I am afraid. You, sir, can you stop the clock? I don't know how to, said Lobsang. But I... I think I should know. I'll try. Would the clockmaker know? He is here. Where, said Susan. Just down the passage, said Lady L.E. Jean. You carried him here. He was barely able to walk. He was hurt badly in the fight. What? said Lobsang. How could he walk at all? We're outside time. Susan took a deep breath. He carries his own time, just like you, she said. He's your brother. And it was a lie. But he wasn't ready for the truth. By the look on his face, he wasn't even ready for the lie. Twins, said M.R.S. Og. She picked up the brandy glass, looked at it, and put it down. There wasn't one. There was twins. Two boys. But. She turned on Susan a glare like a thermic lance. You'll be thinking, this is an old biddy of a midwife, she said. You'll be thinking, what does she know? Susan paid her the courtesy of not lying. Part of me was, she admitted. Good answer. Part of us thinks all kinds of things, said M.R.S. Og. Part of me is thinking, who's this haughty little miss who talks to me as if I was a kitty of five? But most of me is thinking, she's got a heap of troubles of her own and has seen plenty of things a human shouldn't have to see. Mind you, part of me says, so have I. Seeing things a human shouldn't have to see makes us human. Well, miss. If you've any sense, part of you is thinking, there's a witch in front of me who's seen my granddad many times, when she's sat by a sickbed that's suddenly become a deathbed, and if she's ready to spit in his eye when the time comes then she could probably bother me considerably right now if she puts her mind to it. Understand? Let's all keep our parts to ourselves, and suddenly she gave Susan a wink, as the high priest said to the actress. I absolutely agree, said Susan. Completely. Right, said M.R.S. Og. So. Twins. Well, it was her first time, and human wasn't exactly a familiar shape with her, I mean. You can't do what comes naturally when you ain't exactly natural and... Twins ain't quite the right word. A brother, said Lobsang. The clockmaker. Yes, said Susan. But I was a foundling. So was he. I want to see him now. That might not be a good idea, said Susan. I am not interested in your opinion, thank you. Lobsang turned to Lady L.E. Jean. Down that passage. Yes. But he's asleep. I think the clock upset his mind, and also he was hit in the fight. He says things in his sleep. Says what? The last thing I heard him say before I came to find you was, we're so close. Any passage might do, said her ladyship. She looked from one to the other. Have I said the wrong thing? Susan put her hand over her eyes. Oh dear. I said that, said Lobsang. 
just after we came up the stairs. He glared at Susan. Twins, right? I've heard about this sort of thing. What one thinks the other thinks too. Susan sighed. Sometimes, she thought, I really am a coward. Something like that, yes, she said. I'm going to see him, then, even if he can't see me. Damn, thought Susan, and hurried after Lob Sang as he headed along the passage. The auditor trailed behind them, looking concerned. Jeremy was lying on a bed, although it was no softer than anything else in the timeless world. Lob Sang stopped, and stared. He looks. Quite like me, he said. Oh, yes, said Susan. Thinner, perhaps. Could be, yes. Different. Lines on his face. You've led different lives, said Susan. How did you know about him and me? My grandfather takes, er, an interest in this sort of thing. I found out some more by myself, too, she said. Why should we interest anyone? We're not special. This is going to be quite hard to explain. Susan looked round at Lady L.E. Jean. How safe are we here? The signs upset them, said her ladyship. They tend to keep away. I, shall we say, took care of the ones who followed you. Then you'd better sit down, Mr. Lobsang, said Susan. It might help if I told you about me. Well, my grandfather is death. That's a strange thing to say. Death is just the end of life. It's not a... A person pay attention to me when I am talking to you. A wind whipped around the room, and the light changed. Shadows formed on Susan's face. A faint blue light outlined her. Lob Sang swallowed. The light faded. The shadows vanished. There is a process called death, and there is a person called death, said Susan. That is how it works. And I am death's granddaughter. Am I going too fast for you? E.R., no, although right up until just now you looked human, said Lob Sang. My parents were human. There's more than one kind of genetics. Susan paused. You look human, too. Human is a very popular look in these parts. You'd be amazed. Except that I am human. Susan gave a little smile that, on anyone less obviously in full control of themselves, might have seemed slightly nervous. Yes, she said. And, then again, no no. Take war, now, said Susan, backing away from the point. Big man, hearty laugh, tends to fart after meals. As human as the next man, you say. But the next man is death. He's human-shaped, too. And that's because humans invented the idea of... Of... Of ideas and they think in human shapes get back to the end, then again, no, will you? Your mother is time. No one knows who my mother is. I could take you to the midwife, said Susan. Your father found the best there's ever been. She delivered you. Your mother was time. Lob Sang sat with his mouth open. It was easier for me, said Susan. When I was very small my parents used to let me visit my grandfather. I thought every grandfather had a long black robe and rode a pale horse. And then they decided that maybe that wasn't the right environment for a child. They were worried about how I was going to grow up. She laughed mirthlessly. I had a very strange education, you know? Maths, logic, that sort of thing. And then... When I was a bit younger than you, a rat turned up in my room and suddenly everything I thought I knew was wrong. I'm a human. I do human things. I'd know if you had to live in the world. Otherwise, 
How could you learn to be human, said Susan, as kindly as she could. And my brother? What about him? Here it comes, Susan thought. He's not your brother, she said. I lied a bit. I'm sorry. But you said I had to lead up to it, said Susan. It's one of those things you have to get hold of a bit at a time, I'm afraid. He's not your brother. He's you. Then who am I? Susan sighed. You. Both of you. Are you. And there I was, and there she was, said Mrs. Og, and out the baby came, no problem there, but that's always a tryin moment for the new mum, and there was. She paused, her eyes peering through the windows of memory, like. Like a feelin' that the world had stuttered, and I was holdin' the baby and I looked down and there was me deliverin' a baby, and I looked at me, and I looked at me, and I remember saying, this is a fine to do, Mrs. Og, and she, who was me, said, you never said a truer word, Mrs. Og, and then it all went strange and there I was, just one of me, holdin' two babies. Twins, Susan said. You could call them twins, yes, I suppose you could, said Mrs. Og. But I always thought that twins is two little souls born once, not one born twice. Susan waited. Mrs. Og looked in the mood to talk. So I said to the man, I said, what now? And he said, is that any business of yours? And I said he could be damn sure it was my business and he could look me in the eye and I'd speak my mind to anyone. But I was thinking, you're in trouble now, Mrs. Og, cause it all gone mythic. Mythic, said schoolteacher Susan. Yab. With extra myff. And you can get into big trouble, with mythic. But the man just smiled and said that he must be brought up human until he's of age and I thought, yep, it's gone mythic all right. I could see he hadn't got a clue about what to do next and it was all going to be down to me. Mrs. Og took a suck at her pipe and her eyes twinkled at Susan through the smoke. I don't know how much experience you have with this sort of thing, my girl but sometimes when the high and mighty make big plans they don't always think about the fine detail, right? Yes. I'm a fine detail, Susan thought. One day death took it into his skull to adopt a motherless child, and I'm a fine detail. She nodded. I thought, how does this go, in a mythic kind of way? Mrs. Og went on. I mean... Technically I could see we're in that area where the prince gets brought up as a swineherd until he manifests his destiny, but there's not that many swineherding jobs around these days, and poking hogs with a stick is not all it's cracked up to be, believe you me. So I said, well, I'd heard the guilds down in the big cities took in foundlings out of charity, and looked after them well enough, and there's many well set up men and women who started life that way. There's no shame in it, plus, if the destiny doesn't manifest as per schedule, he'd have set his hands to a good trade, which would be a consolation. Whereas swineherding s just swineherding. You're giving me a stern look, Miss Well, yes. It was rather a chilly decision, wasn't it? Someone has to make em, said Mrs. Og sharply. Besides, I've been around for some time and I've noticed that them as has it in them to shine will shine through six layers of muck, whereas those who ain't shiny won't shine however much you buff em. You may think otherwise, but it was me standing there. She investigated the bowl of her pipe with a matchstick. Eventually she went on. And that was it. I would have stayed, of course, because there wasn't so much as a crib in the place but the man took me aside and said thank you and that it was time to go. And why would I argue? There was love there. It was in the air. But I won't say that I don't sometimes wonder how it all turned out. I really do. There were differences, Susan had to admit. 
Two different lives had indeed burned their unique tracks on the faces. And the selves had been born a second or so apart, and a lot of the universe can change in a second. Think of identical twins, she told herself. But they are two different selves occupying bodies that, at least, start out identical. The Don T start out as identical selves. He looks quite like me, said Lobsang, and Susan blinked. She leaned closer to the unconscious form of Jeremy. Say that again, she said. I said, he looks quite like me, said Lobsang. Susan glanced at Lady L.E. Jean, who said, I saw it too, Susan. Who saw what, said Lobsang. What are you hiding from me? His lips move when you speak, said Susan. They try to form the same words. He can pick up my thoughts. It's more complicated than that, I think. Susan picked up a limp hand and gently pinched the web of skin between thumb and forefinger. Lob Sang winced, and glanced at his own hand. A patch of white skin was reddening again. Not just thoughts, said Susan. This close, you feel his pain. Your speech controls his lips. Lob Sang stared down at Jeremy. Then what will happen, he said slowly, when he comes round. I'm wondering the same thing, said Susan. Perhaps you shouldn't be here. But this is where I have to be. We at least should not stay here, said Lady L.E. Jean. I know my kind. They will have been discussing what to do. The signs will not hold them forever. And I have run out of soft centers. What are you supposed to do when you are where you are supposed to be, said Susan. Lob Sang reached down and touched Jeremy's hand with his fingertip. The world went white. Susan wondered later if this was what it would be like at the heart of a star. It wouldn't be yellow, you wouldn't see fire, there would just be the searing whiteness of every overloaded sense screaming all at once. It faded, gradually, into a mist. The walls of the room appeared, but she could see through them. There were other walls beyond, and other rooms, transparent as ice and visible only at the corners and where the light caught them. In each one another Susan was turning to look at her. The rooms went on forever. Susan was sensible. It was, she knew, a major character flaw. It did not make you popular, or cheerful, and... This seemed to her to be the most unfair bit. It didn't even make you right. But it did make you definite, and she was definite that what was happening around her was not, in any accepted sense, real. That was not in itself a problem. Most of the things humans busied themselves with weren't real, either. But sometimes the mind of the most sensible person encountered something so big, so complex, so alien to all understanding, that it told itself little stories about it instead. Then, when it felt it understood the story, it felt it understood the huge incomprehensible thing. And this, Susan knew, was her mind telling itself a story. There was a sound like great heavy metal doors slamming, one after another, getting louder and faster. The universe reached a decision. The other glass rooms vanished. The walls clouded. Color rose, pastel at first, then darkening as timeless reality flowed back. The bed was empty. Lob Sang had gone. But the air was full of slivers of blue light, turning and swirling like ribbons in a storm. Susan remembered to breathe again. Oh, she said aloud. Destiny. She turned. The bedraggled Lady L.E. Jean was still staring at the empty bed. Is there another way out of here? There's an elevator at the end of the corridor, Susan, but what happened to... Not Susan, said Susan sharply. It's Miss Susan. I'm only Susan to my friends, and you are not one of them. I don't trust you at all. I don't trust me either, 
said Lady L.E. Jean meekly. Does that help? Show me this elevator, will you? It turned out to be nothing more than a large box the size of a small room, which hung from a web of ropes and pulleys in the ceiling. It had been installed recently, by the look of it, to move the large works of art around. Sliding doors occupied most of one wall. There are capstans in the cellar for winching it up, said Lady L.E. Jean. Downward journeys are slowed safely because of a mechanism by which the weight of the descending elevator causes water to be pumped up into rainwater cisterns on the roof, which in turn can be released back into a hollow counterweight that assists in the elevation of heavier items of thank you, said Susan quickly. But what it really needs in order to descend is time. Under her breath she added, Can you help? The ribbons of blue light orbited her like puppies anxious to play, and then drifted towards the elevator. However, she added, I believe time is on our side now. Miss Tangerine was amazed at how fast a body learned. Until now auditors had learned by counting. Sooner or later, everything came down to numbers. If you knew all the numbers, you knew everything. Often the later was a lot later but that did not matter because for an auditor time was just another number. But a brain, a few soggy pounds of gristle, counted numbers so fast that they stopped being numbers at all. She'd been astonished at how easily it could direct a hand to catch a ball in the air, calculating future positions of hand and ball without her even being aware of it. The senses seemed to operate and present her with conclusions before she had time to think. At the moment she was trying to explain to other auditors that not feeding an elephant when there was no elephant not to feed was not in fact impossible. Miss Tangerine was one of the faster learning auditors and had already formulated a group of things, events, and situations that she categorized as bloody stupid. Things that were bloody stupid could be dismissed. Some of the others were having difficulty understanding this but now she stopped in mid-harangue when she heard the rumble of the elevator. Do we have anyone upstairs? she demanded. The auditors around her shook their heads. Ignore this notice had produced too much confusion. Then someone is coming down, said Miss Tangerine. They are out of place. They must be stopped. We must discuss an auditor began. Do what I say you organic organ. It's a matter of personalities, said Lady L.E. Jean, as Susan pushed open a door in the roof and stepped out onto the leads. Yes, said Susan, looking around at the silent city. I thought you didn't have them. They will have them now, said Lady L.E. Jean, climbing out behind her. And personalities define themselves in terms of other personalities. Susan prowling along the parapet, considered this strange sentence. You mean there will be flaming rose, she said. Yes. We have never had egos before. Well, you seem to be managing. Only by becoming completely and utterly insane, said her ladyship. Susan turned. Lady Ellie Jean's hat and dress had become even more tattered, and she was shedding sequins. And then there was the matter of the face. An exquisite mask on a bone structure like fine china had been made up by a clown. Probably a blind clown. And one who was wearing boxing gloves. In a fog. Lady L.E. Jean looked at the world through panda eyes and her lipstick touched her mouth only by accident. You don't look insane, lied Susan. As such. Thank you. But sanity is defined by the majority, I am afraid. Do you know the saying the whole is greater than the sum of the parts? Of course. Susan scanned the rooftops for a way down. She did not need this. They. Things seemed to want to talk. Or, rather, to chatter aimlessly. It is an insane statement. It is a nonsense. But now I believe that it is true. Good. That elevator should be getting down about. Now. 
slivers of blue light, like trout slipping through a stream, danced around the elevator door. The auditors gathered. They had been learning. Many of them had acquired weapons. And a number of them had taken care not to communicate to the others that gripping something offensive in the hand seemed a very natural thing to do. It spoke to something right down in the back of the brain. It was therefore unfortunate that when a couple of them pulled open the elevator door it was to reveal, slightly melting in the middle of the floor, a cherry liqueur chocolate. The scent wafted. There was only one survivor and, when Miss Tangerine ate the chocolate, there wasn't even that. One of life's little certainties, said Susan, standing on the edge of the museum's parapet is that there is generally a last chocolate hidden in all those empty wrappers. Then she reached down and grabbed the top of a drainpipe. She wasn't certain how this would work. If she fell. But would she fall? There was no time to fall. She had her own personal time. In theory, if anything so definite as a theory existed in a case like this, that meant she could just drift down to the ground. But the time to test a theory like that was when you had no other choice. A theory was just an idea, but a drainpipe was a fact. The blue light flickered around her hands. Lobsang, she said quietly. It is you, isn't it? That name is as good as any for us. The voice was as faint as a breath. This may seem a stupid question, but where are you? We are just a memory. And I am weak. Oh. Susan slid a little further. But I will grow strong. Get to the clock. What's the point? There was nothing we could do. Times have changed. Susan reached the ground. Lady Ellie Jean followed, moving clumsily. Her evening dress had acquired several more tears. Can I offer a fashion tip, said Susan. It would be welcomed, said her ladyship politely. Long cerise bloomers with that dress. Not a good idea. No. They are very colorful, and quite warm. What should I have chosen instead? With that cut? Practically nothing. That would have been acceptable. E.R. Susan blanched at unfolding the complex laws of lingerie to someone who wasn't even she felt, anybody. To anyone likely to find out, yes, she finished. It would take too long to explain. Lady L.E. Jean sighed. All of it does, she said. Even clothing. Skin substitutes to preserve body heat. So simple. So easy to say. But there are so many rules and exceptions, impossible to understand. Susan looked along Broadway. It was thick with silent traffic, but there was no sign of an auditor. We'll run into more of them, she said aloud. Yes. There will be hundreds, at least, said Lady L.E. Jean. Why? Because we have always wondered what life is like. Then let's get up into Zephyr Street, said Susan. What is there for us? Veen Rich and Butcher. Who are they? I think the original Herr Veen Rich and Frau Butcher died a long time ago. But the shop still does very good business, said Susan, darting across the street. We need ammunition. Lady L.E. Jean caught up. Oh. They make chocolate, she said. Does a bear P.O.O. in the woods, said Susan and realized her mistake straight away. Sixteen too late. Lady L.E. Jean looked thoughtful for a moment. Yes, she said at last. Yes, I believe that most varieties do indeed excrete as you suggest, at least in the temperate zones, but there are several that I meant to say that, yes, they make chocolate, said Susan. Vanity, vanity, thought Eliudza as the milk cart rattled through the silent city. Ronnie would have been like a god, and people of that stripe don't like hiding. Not really hiding. 
They like to leave a little clue, some emerald tablet somewhere, some code in some tomb under the desert, something to say to the keen researcher. I was here, and I was great. What else had the first people been afraid of? Night, maybe. Cold. Bears. Winter. Stars. The endless sky. Spiders. Snakes. One another. People had been afraid of so many things. He reached into his pack for the battered copy of The Way, and opened it at random. Koan 97. Do unto otters as you would have them do unto you. Hmm. No real help there. Besides, he'd occasionally been unsure that he'd written that one down properly, although it certainly had worked. He'd always left aquatic mammals well alone, and they had done the same to him. He tried again. Koan 124 It's amazing what you see if you keep your eyes open. What's the book, monk, said Ronnie. Oh, just. A little book, said El Yudza. He looked around. The cart was passing a funeral parlor. The owner had invested in a large plate glass window, even though the professional undertaker does not, in truth, have that much to sell that looks good in a window and they usually make do with dark, somber drapes and perhaps a tasteful urn. And the name of the fifth horseman. Ha, said El Yudza quietly. Something funny, monk. Obvious, when you think about it, said El Yudza as much to himself as to Ronnie. Then he turned in his seat and stuck out his hand. Pleased to meet you, he said. Let me guess your name. And said it. Susan had been unusually inexact. To call Veen Rich and Bircher chocolate makers was like calling Leonard of Quirm a decent painter who also tinkered with things, or death not someone you'd want to meet every day. It was accurate but it didn't tell the whole story. For one thing, they didn't make, they created. There's an important difference. Seventeen and, while their select little shop sold the results, it didn't do anything so crass as to fill the window with them. That would suggest. Well, over-eagerness. Generally, W splay of silk and velvet drapes with, on a small stand, perhaps one of their special pralines or no more than three of their renowned frosted caramels. There was no price tag. If you had to ask the price of W8s, you couldn't afford them. And if you tasted one, and still couldn't afford them, you'd save and scrimp and rob and sell elderly members of your family for just one more of those mouthfuls that fell in love with your tongue and turned your soul to whipped cream. There was a discreet drain in the pavement in case people standing in front of the window drooled too much. Veenrich and Bircher were, naturally, foreigners, and according to Ankh Morpork's Guild of Confectioners they did not understand the peculiarities of the city's taste buds. Ankh Morpork people, said the Guild, were hardy, no-nonsense folk who did not want chocolate that was stuffed with cocoa liquor and were certainly not like effete la da da foreigners who wanted cream in everything. In fact they actually preferred chocolate made mostly from milk, sugar, suet, hooves, lips, miscellaneous squeezings, rat droppings, plaster, flies, tallow, bits of tree, hair, lint, spiders and powdered cocoa husks. This meant that according to the food standards of the great chocolate centers in Borogravia and Quirm, Ankh Morpork chocolate was formally classed as cheese and only escaped, through being the wrong color, being defined as tile grout. Susan allowed herself one of their cheaper boxes per month. And she could easily stop at the first layer if she wanted to. You needn't come in, she said, as she opened the shop door. Rigid customers lined the counter. Please call me Miria. I don't think I please, said Lady L.E. Jean meekly. A name is important. Suddenly, in spite of everything, 
Susan felt a brief pang of sympathy for the creature. Oh, very well. Miria, you needn't come in. I can stand it. But I thought chocolate was a raging temptation, said Susan, being firm with herself. It is. They stared up at the shelves behind the counter. Miria. Miria, said Susan, speaking only some of her thoughts aloud. From the Ephibian word Mirios, meaning innumerable. And L.E. Jean as a crude pun of legion. Oh dear. We thought a name should say what a thing is, said her ladyship. And there is safety in numbers. I am sorry. Well, these are their basic assortments, said Susan, dismissing the shop display with a wave of her hand. Let's try the back room are you all right? I am fine, I am fine. Murmured Lady L.E. Jean, swaying. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.